Tonight, be fair. Not every name in the Epstein files is guilty of a crime or even wrongdoing. But for others, did the FBI play defense for the rich and powerful? But you were staying at the house of yes. a convicted sex offender. It was a convenient place to stay. Gloria all read on the victims named and not named. President Biden reveals his re-election strategy. Noun, verb, January 6th. Will years of inflation and skyrocketing prices sink that strategy? Harvard Havoc. She had a thin academic record to begin with. Will the billionaire head of Harvard's secretive board fall on her sword to save DEI? How Claudine Gay's plagiarism focused attention on one of America's most powerful women. Trump attacks. The first anti-Nikki ad drops. Can he stop her rise in New Hampshire? Trump knows he's in trouble. That's why he's, he's trying to uh, chip at her a little bit. And coming to America. Where are you going? How these images encouraged a new caravan of 15,000 to start marching north. Don't worry, the Red Cross will help. Why they're suggesting women bring birth control. We start with breaking news in just the past hour here in Washington. We got another 19 Jeffrey Epstein files, now totaling 328 additional pages for us to go through. These are documents and information the government has had for years but kept under wraps. We are going through them page by page, line by line. We'll have the very latest of this new batch uh, as we're able to verify the information in it. With that, we welcome you to the Ferris Show on television. And that distinction, Ferris Show, carries a special responsibility with our lead story tonight. The Jeffrey Epstein files read like a who's who of 90s and early 2000s celebrities. The names and stories you're about to hear come from files in a 2015 lawsuit by Epstein victim Virginia Gufri. The depositions were people where people testified under oath. So the stories in the names have been brought up not just in reporting, but now in court documents and sworn to under oath. Prince Andrew, Bill Clinton, Stephen Hawking, Al Gore, Victoria's Secret CEO Les Wexner, billionaire and Hyatt Hotel heir Tom Pritzker, former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, Kevin Spacey, Naomi Campbell, Kate Blanchett, Leonardo DiCaprio, Michael Jackson. It's a stunning list. And let's be clear, anybody who hung out with Epstein after 2008 did so after Epstein pled guilty to child prostitution. He was a known predator. But fairness dictates that we must separate the salacious storytelling from the facts. For example, Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Blanchett are in the files because Epstein bragged about knowing them. The accuser testified to never having met them. It's hardly fair to now link them to Epstein's behavior. Michael Jackson, one of Epstein's victims, said she never performed a massage on him. Okay. Knowing or hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein is the least of Michael Jackson's oddities. David Copperfield performed magic tricks at a dinner. Hardly evidence of wrongdoing. Then there are the men accused of some very tawdry behavior. Virginia Epstein's victim, Virginia Gufri, again said under oath, she was directed to have sex with Thomas Pritzker, the Hyatt Hotel heir, hedge fund manager Glenn Dubman, former Senator George Mitchell, former New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson, Massachusetts Institute of Technology professor Marvin Minsky, and modeling agent Jean-Luc Brunel. All of these men have vehemently denied the allegations. Men of power having affairs is nothing new in this world. It doesn't make it right. But it is not necessarily newsworthy. But, and this is an important but, if a secretive man like Epstein is paying young women to trap the world's rich and powerful, then it is a huge story. Journalist Mike Schellenberger says the files provide new evidence Jeffrey Epstein ran sex blackmail operations for intelligence agencies. We'll get to that in a minute. And as we have said, the FBI and others had this information for years. They never charged the men. Is that because it didn't happen? We don't know. But the Epstein conspiracy theories always require a few leaps to connect the dots. 
The files say Epstein told one of his victims, President Bill Clinton, liked, quote, young girls. We figured that out 25 years ago. Mona Lewinsky became a household name. This isn't new. It's tawdry gossip. There is nothing in the files yet to suggest Bill Clinton did anything wrong. Famed women's advocate and attorney Gloria Allred is with us to break down the legal parts of this, but we start with Jen Smith, chief reporter for The Daily Mail, who's been going through these. Jen, um, we are in the news business. What really is news out of this? Not very much. You know, as you say, there is not a huge amount of new detail, not very many specific allegations. We do have one against Prince Andrew detailing an orgy, that's the word that was used, on Epstein's Caribbean island, which the palace is yet to answer for. Andrew hasn't. Obviously, we know what he said in the past. But it, it, you're right. I mean, these documents really just paint a wider picture of how deeply entrenched Jeffrey Epstein was in the upper echelons of New York society. And, you know, if you look at this role Rolodex, the length that uh, some of these people were prepared to go to to overlook his behavior and his uh, conviction down in Florida for the child, um, the, the prostitution, child prostitution, which he pled guilty to. As you said, anyone who hung out with him after that, you know, they knew about it. So there's yeah. a lot of people looking the other way. This is, I think, an indictment on you know, Hollywood elitism more than it is a trove of uh, bombshell new allegations. Have we gotten any closer to the why, why so many people uh, felt the desire, the need, the willingness to hang out with someone who had pled guilty to child sex crimes, why people gave him money to manage even when he was a pretty lackluster money manager, why they would go to his island? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the why is, is really the crux of this whole thing. As you said, many of these people had their own money, could host their own parties. It doesn't rise to the level of pedophilia, just hanging out with him, right? But I think that perhaps, I don't want to use the word innocent, but simpler explanation is that these people were, you know, snobs, Leland, elitists. They were hanging out in a circle with a guy who was clearly very well connected. Obviously, conspiracy theorists will say, well, he must have had some dirt on them and they were terrified that he was going to out them. There's a kind of really fringe theory that he might have been working on behalf of the Israeli government. I don't really know where that one is going. But what is likely an explanation is that people never demanded answers or really took a good cold look at his behavior because they were impressed with the money. There was a famous line in an expose about Jeffrey Epstein a few years ago um, about how he was able to re-enter New York society. And the society diarist who was interviewed said the only thing that gets you banished from New York high society is poverty. It's not a criminal record. Mm -hmm. And that looks to have been the case here. Yeah. Well, there's uh, another 350 pages to go through. We'll let you get to that. We'll read about it. Um, DailyMail.com for Jen's uh, incredible reporting on this and so many other issues. Jen, thank you. Thanks. With us now, Gloria Allred, who represented some of Epstein's accusers all the way back in 2019. Gloria, it's good to see you. Um, just start with the legal sense here. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'll use what I think is the legal word of actionable. Is any of the things that we see in these documents so far yet uh, actionable, either civilly or criminally? Well, I haven't read through all of them, so I really can't say, but I will say this. In terms of the criminal uh, that you have just asked about, and I do represent, by the way, 20 uh, of Epstein's victims, uh, and I still represent them, the criminal prosecutors, I have no doubt, the federal prosecutors, especially from New York, who prosecuted Ms. Maxwell, uh, know probably everything that is in whatever has come out and whatever will come out of in these pages and pages and pages of documents. They took a deep dive into Epstein when they prosecuted not only Epstein, but also Ms. Maxwell. Of course, Epstein you know, committed suicide, apparently, or reportedly, when he was uh, being held in custody awaiting trial. Uh, so the jury never had a chance to decide if he was guilty or not. Ms. Maxwell, they did decide that. But the prosecutors know all of it and have not charged anyone else. As to Prince Andrew, uh, they made it clear publicly 
and uh, that they would like to talk to Prince Andrew and ask him many questions. There, it is indisputable, and Prince Andrew has admitted that he stayed with Jeffrey Epstein in his New in Epstein's New York mansion. And um, you know, there are allegations that he traveled to other properties, new the New Mexico ranch of, of uh, Epstein, uh, potentially to Florida. We don't know uh, whether he went to Little St. James Island or not, but he has declined to uh, speak to prosecutors, to Homeland Security, to the FBI. Why? Uh, That question is left hanging in the air. We don't know why, uh, but it seems to me, if there's nothing to hide, that he would want to answer questions. Why? He was in the New York mansion. There were a lot of young girls running around there. And so- You represent 20 of these these women, of these victims. Yes. Um, and I know I don't I won't ask you to break attorney client privilege, but I will note that these women are victims. The only person mm-hmm. serving prison time is a woman. And there is accusations of an enormous amount of men who have and I'll use this term, I guess, that I can on family friendly television benefited um, from from Jeffrey Epstein's uh, harem, for lack mm-hmm. of a better term. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you know or have heard of things that should be investigated criminally that you feel prosecutors are either slow walking or covering up or not being aggressive about as it relates to other men? Well, I mean, you earlier mentioned the word affair. Of course, an adult man, if he has sex with an underage girl, is not having an affair. He is committing an act of child sexual abuse. It's against the law. Uh, It is a crime. Uh, But of course, then the victims would need to testify. Not every victim, Leon, especially those who were underage at the time, is willing to testify. Either it's too painful for them to have to remember what was done to them. They don't, they feel ashamed. They feel sometimes maybe it was their fault. They were stupid. They were ashamed. Of course, they weren't stupid. They were victimized. But I'm saying to testify at a public trial takes a lot of courage. Yeah. And some of them are just not emotionally up to it. And I don't fault them for that. They've been through a lot. Jeffrey yeah. Epstein, and I have reviewed many of his emails to some of my clients. And of course, I can't disclose what those emails say. But I will say that I see who Jeffrey Epstein really was from his own words. He was controlling. He was manipulative. He had a scheme. He uh, was do we, he do, harmed do we, them. Based on these, based dangerous. on these emails, did we did we get to the why in the emails? Do, do, was this to get blackmail on other men? Um, I'm making a couple of leaps here, but if we are to assume that he provided underage women to other men, which is I think where you're going with this. Um, do we get to the why? Was it to, to blackmail them for money? Was it because he wanted power over them for some other reason that he was in controlling by controlled by an intelligence service? Do we get there? Uh, you know, he's not going to say those things. I didn't see anything where he said those things to the victims, but but I haven't seen all of the emails to all of the victims because only represent let me, let me 20 ask of you them. one. But I will say this, he want, you know, I think he had a motive. It wasn't innocent. And um, he used the power and the prestige and the fact that he knew these people, these, uh, you know, very famous people, these wealthy people, these prestigious people to essentially bait to, to, to take these victims and lure them into his spider's web of deceit. You know, suggesting that he could get them educational opportunities into the most famous right. educational institutions in our country, to get them careers, perhaps in fashion, to yeah, get no, them no, no, in the entertainment community. Uh, you get no argument. You get no argument from me that he was a truly evil human being um, and mm-hmm. perpetrated crimes that were horrific, uh, sexually exploiting a young girl. I, there, there are few things that are worse, um, really, but. I, in terms of where we go from here and what these files will reveal, uh, do you know of names that have not yet been brought up uh, in well, these there files? Are, there are names. Uh, you know, I don't know who else 
I do know that the judge has been really very sensitive, Leland, and she has said no names of underage victims of sex trafficking by uh, Epstein are going to be revealed. Now, as to adults who have spoke, you know, adult victims of adult sexual abuse, um, he's given any or she's given any victims the opportunity to object to the release of their names, and then she'll consider it. So I, okay. maybe there'll be more names of victims coming out. I don't know. Here's what the my clients or victims want. They want the truth. They want to know everything they can about what happened to them and why. And the answers to some of your questions were, were right on. And also, they would like as much accountability and as much justice as is possible under the circumstances. Yeah. Well, and they and they deserve it. You get no argument. We, we've got to run. Um, I appreciate your time, and I know you're the victims, mm -hmm. and I know there's a lot of women who have been victimized in other ways that appreciate your advocacy um, for you. them. We'll we'll talk soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, 330 more pages out just in the past half hour. We'll have more on the breaking news with Cuomo later in the show next. There's a civil war at Harvard Yard as the billionaire head of the Harvard Corporation faces calls for her own resignation. So, who picks who leads the most heralded institution in America? You might call it the Battle of the Billionaires coming up. And Trump weighs in on the MAGA Civil War, hitting Nikki Haley with a dark new campaign ad, another sign we should be taking Haley's rise very seriously. Confirm warnings of terrorists sneaking in through our southern border. Yet Haley joined Biden in opposing Trump's visitor ban from terrorist nations. Haley's weakness puts us in grave danger. Bad faith smear campaign against, um, you know, Harvard's first black woman president. And, and the criticisms, um, you know, were targeted to her identity. This is higher education being attacked by mob rule, I think, is something that we should be very wary of. As CBS would like you to believe, the mob is after Harvard. And to be fair, the conservative mob, in a way, is behaving a lot like the Me Too and cancel culture mob. Conservatives, even traditional non-conservatives, just normal people, see blood in the water. The real prize in the fight over Harvard and DEI wasn't, isn't, Harvard's president, now resigned president, Claudine Gay. It's the head of Harvard's board, Penny Pritzker. She led the search to hire gay based on diversity and race, not on merit, defended gay, and also went after those who were rightfully reporting on gay's plagiarism. And Pritzker will once again lead the search for a new president. She's also a former Obama cabinet secretary and billionaire heir to the Hyatt hotel chain. Now it's the battle of the billionaires. Fellow Harvard alum Bill Ackman says Pritzker must go. The fish rots from the head. My words, not his. Joining me now, senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, Victor Davis Hanson. Good to see you, sir. You think I'm fair to compare how the the push now for more attacks at Harvard and for more resignations at Harvard is kind of similar to what we saw during cancel culture and Me Too? Uh, I don't really because of this. I mean, the Washington Post op-ed writers, some of them called for her resignation. The New York Times did. A lot of black intellectuals have called for her resignation. It's been it's been nonpartisan. The donors are overwhelmingly democratic to Harvard University by by it's it's about ninety to ten percent, and a lot of them have called. So this is not just there are people on the right, no doubt, that would like to see her go for you know the, their war against woke, but she plagiarized over two dozen times, and you can't have you can either be the most preeminent university in the United States or have a college president who is a plagiarist. And that was on top of the other testimonies where in the Congress she just either couldn't or wouldn't address anti-Semitism that was epidemic on our campus. And as far as being racist, we've had, I at my university, we had a white male that was fired for not fully authenticating an co-authored article at Stanford University decades ago. Decades ago. White male. And, and we saw uh, for President McGill of Pennsylvania resigned before she did, and she had a very impressive scholarly record with not a hint of plagiarism. So if anything, uh, 
President Gay lasted and uh, she she endured the allegations. You, you get no of argument with me. I, 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 you get no argument with me on President Gay. I'm thinking about now yeah. the calls for Penny Pritzker to go. Oh, and, I, see, well, and, I, I agree. No, I don't. I think that she's going to have to step down. You see, because for two reasons. One, when she, as the head of the Harvard Corporation, was faced with these charges, she they created under her directorship a euphemism that said they were just duplicative language. And then when they their Resigna- when the resignation came out, she, they called these plagiar- these acts of plagiarism missteps. They created a whole vocabulary. They sick their legal term on legal team on the New York Post. They re- reinvented plagiarism. They had 700 faculty members who said that basically, if you're not aggrieved, if you're plagiarized, but you're the victim and you don't press charges, that's not plagiarism. So they did all sorts of things, and now she's got a bigger dilemma, and that is, by any fair measure, disinterested measure, you have a professor of political science in the political science department who has plagiarized on over two dozen occasions. And that would be a firing or at least a suspension for any other faculty member. So Chairman Pritzker now is in the unenviable position of legitimizing that among her faculty with the full knowledge that 40 to 50 students are expelled or suspended or reprimanded and probably three or four faculty members are every year for allegations of plagiarism that are a lot less egregious than what we know of uh, now Professor Gay in the political science department. So what do they do now? Yeah, I, I don't know. I can't figure out how Harvard now, now ever punishes a, a, a student for for plagiarism, they said, wait a second, you know, the, the, the no, president did it, they, she got to keep her job, and now she's a professor. Let's look at how this is going forward. Axios uh, wrote, uh, companies are backing away from DEI, and they basically, it was a, an obituary, a pre-mortem, if you will, to DEI, and, and lamented how, you know, DEI is being attacked, it's being weaponized, you know, the equity versus equality is being weaponized, on and on and on. But it did strike me that Pritzker, who so badly wanted to hold on to Gay as president, so badly wanted to defend DEI, still believes in it. By keeping Gay around, defending her, inventing the language, as you pointed out, has now created and forced this national conversation over really whether DEI is fair and exposed it for what it is, which is equity of outcome, not equality of opportunity. People are seeing that and seeing what it did at Harvard and what it created at Harvard, and they don't like it. Well, she's proven what all of her worst critics had alleged, that it's elementally racist in nature. It really is, because it says that if you're Colleen Gay or a black person, or at least a black liberal person, because she did go after black conservatives for, I think, on sound reasons, but it means that you're going to be subject to a standard that's a plot not applied to everybody, just to you. And we know that that's true. When she testified under oath to Congress, she said that this epidemic of anti-Semitism and behavior and in speech, that it depended on context and First Amendment considerations. That's, that wasn't true, at least according to her own code of behavior, because she has expelled, suspended, punished all sorts of professors and groups for free speech that she considered was illiberal or anti-DI or unhurtful yeah. or harmful. She does it all the time. So all three presidents did it. And so that was what I think sparked the investigations of her own record is when she got up there with the other two presidents and then flat out misled Congress as if the First Amendment and free speech is the driving uh, rationale through all of their campuses on matters of, you know, controversial behavior and speech when it isn't. It's just simply the ideology of the person who expresses that speech. Yeah. Well said, Victor Davis Hanson. We're always smarter uh, after we hear from you. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. And you have such a unique knowledge uh, of this, given, given your academic background, sir. It's good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. I think there's a concern that she's taken the endorsement and the support of the Koch brothers. They're not really mainstream Republicans. They're libertarian. I, I don't think it's a personal issue, but I think it's a policy issue. That's former presidential candidate Mike Huckabee on the program talking about the civil war right now in the GOP over Nikki Haley. Haley has momentum, and that's something that scares Trump world. In fact, the former president has a new ad out attacking Haley. We'll get to that in a minute. Here's her reaction. 
President Trump's giving me some attention these days. I'm kind of flattered. <laughs> I'm flattered because I know he sees what we're seeing, and that means we're surging. Fair enough, she is surging. Her meteoric rise started in New Hampshire after Governor Chris Sununu endorsed her for president. Polling average from our partners at DDHQ shows she's the clear second choice in the Granite State, trailing Donald Trump by 17 percentage points. Individual polls put her a lot closer. Governor Sununu is with us now. So call it 17 points, call it 12 points, 15 points in about 19 days until the primary governor. What has to happen for Nikki Haley to win New Hampshire? Nikki has to keep doing what she's doing, which is uh, the retail politics, uh, engaging with people one-on-one, -on -one, talking about policies that decentralize government, that drain the swamp, all these things we heard about that Trump was going to do. And he had some good policy ideas, but that's yesterday's news. And, and we're Republicans. We're always going to look to the next generation, future generation leadership. So what she's doing is working. And uh, three weeks is actually a lifetime uh, in New Hampshire politics. A lot can happen there. Um, I think John McCain was back by, you know, seven or eight points. He won by... 20 or whatever it was uh, in New Hampshire years ago. So, I mean, when you look at what can happen in this last month, um, it's all right there. And Trump isn't going up. No one is saying, you know what, I've changed my mind. I'm now back on the Trump. No, Ev everything is going in Nikki's direction. I think there's going to be consolidation mm -hmm. with DeSantis, a lot of Christie voters coming on board. So uh, Trump knows he's in trouble. That's why he's, he's trying to uh, chip at her a little bit. Um, but again, I just think New Hampshire, as we have traditionally been, is a big reset button for the whole country. It's all about making folks realize that Trump as the nominee is not inevitable. It's not what the mainstream media has told us. Um, it really is about good campaigning. And from here, Nikki goes back to her home state of South Carolina. And she definitely knows you, how to you win made, there. So there's a lot of opportunity here. You, you made the point about Chris Christie, um, who is the never Trump candidate, right? And he, he talks about how that is so important for him to be in the race. But he's also taking a pretty sizable amount of voters who we know from polling would be Haley voters, but for Chris Christie. He was asked about that this morning on the Hugh Hewitt radio show. Take a listen. <clears throat> You're staying in. I'm not the view. You're not going to put this over on me. You're staying in the primary undeniably helps Donald Trump get the election, doesn't it? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, the, the fact is that um, we're going out. We're the only one running against Donald Trump. It'd make it a lot easier to win New Hampshire if Chris Christie dropped out, wouldn't it? Of course. No, th there's no doubt about it. There's one person that really wants Chris Christie to stay in this race. Donald Trump. I mean, that, that's just it. So I think Chris has run a good race. He's a smart guy. He's a good candidate. He kind of had that singular strategy of attacking Trump. And again, t telling the truth on Trump and, and hitting Trump hard, it just hasn't translated to the votes, right? And, and, that's, and we always knew that that was a risk. And he, I think even Chris would acknowledge that that was a, a long shot uh, from the very, very beginning. Um, I mean, when you have 12 candidates in the race, every candidate is technically a long shot. So it shouldn't be a surprise that, the, that his race is coming to an end. Uh, I think Chris has an amazing opportunity to, be, as I say, be the hero, right, to really be the one that helps Nikki get over the top to help deliver Trump the loss that Chris mm -hmm. has been been trying to deliver for a while. And he can take a lot of credit for that. So he's a smart guy. I think he's going to I think he's going to come around at the end. I know his voters are already if you look at some of the latest polls of uh, the singular polls, not just the averages, the latest polls day by day, the Christie voters are coming. There's just no question about mm -hmm. that, uh, because folks want it to be a one on one race. And it is. It's Trump versus Haley at this point. Um, and uh, these are other these are, like I said, good candidates, but everyone's consolidated at this time, and, and uh, obviously it'd be easier if these guys got out, but it, that's a decision for them to make. Before New Hampshire is Iowa. It's different. It's a different electorate. And Nikki Haley said something in New Hampshire about Iowa that I think uh, at least deserves a little bit of attention. Take a listen. You know Iowa starts it. You know that you correct it. You know that you continue to go... <laughs> If she's going to be the consensus Big Tent candidate, I, I get ignoring Iowa maybe and instead going to the border or going to Israel or going to somewhere else. But why, why insult it? 
Oh, I, look, I, come on. I think she was making a, a, a little joke to the crowd. It was, it was kind of funny. I think folks know Trump is going to likely win the Iowa caucus. I mean, the, the caucus is designed for Trump. So I think that's what she's referring to. It's a one-on-one -on -one race. Mm -hmm. The caucus is really designed for Trump to win. She's going to come in and deliver a big win in New Hampshire. So I don't think she was insulting Iowa at all. She spent so much time there. She's on the ground there. She's surging there. I mean, her numbers keep going up, up in Iowa, which is terrific. Um, I think, I mean, I, I would love for her to outperform and kind of shock everyone. One there, I think it, it, it sends a great message. But Iowa and different uh, Iowa and New Hampshire are very different. I don't think she's insulting Iowa at all. I think she just she made a little right. joke because everyone knows Trump's going to win the caucus and and she's going to do well here. Well, fair fair enough. It certainly played to the crowd in New Hampshire, Governor. It's good to see you. We'll be up there on the trail with you in you a couple of weeks. All right, can't wait to see you. Thank you, buddy. Right, there is the war, real war, and there is political war. Learn it all about it in War Notes. Free look at the show every day at 4 p.m. Go to warnotes.com and subscribe. The notes started about the war in Israel as our internal email discussion about the most important events of the day. It's how we put the show together. You get to be a part of it. You can respond to the email with your thoughts or join us on social media at Leland Vitter on Instagram or Twitter. That's warnotes.com and subscribe for free. Breaking news. Back to the Epstein breaking news. Our reporters and producers are going through 328 just released pages that Jeffrey Epstein didn't want you to see. They would make Roman emperors and Greek gods blush. That on the other side of the break. Giuliani, there's, two, there's only three things he mentioned in a sentence a noun and a verb and 9 11. I mean, that's then candidate Biden in 2008. Perhaps it provided inspiration for Mr. Biden's reelection campaign, which can be described as noun, verb, January 6th. Just watch his latest ad. There's something dangerous happening in America. There's an extremist movement that does not share the basic beliefs in our democracy. All of us are being asked right now, what will we do to maintain our democracy? Because of a coming snowstorm, Mr. Biden will commemorate January 6th on January 5th this year. He's moved up his Valley Forge campaign speech a day to Friday. Here now, Director of Data Science, Decision Desk HQ, our partners, Scott Tranter and politics reporter at The Hill, Julia Manchester. Nice to see both of you. This is reporting from our friend Alex Thompson at Axios. Senior campaign officials say the venue is apt. It's where Washington's army endured a frigid winter in 77 to 78 before un uh, uniting his troops and fighting for democracy and freedom against the British. Biden will try to rally his party for a fight against MAGA extremism. Scott Tranter, does polling show this actually works? Uh, look, polling shows a lot of things work, depending on how you phrase the question. That's kind of how I look at that poll right there. I think what's interesting for Biden, at least coming into his campaign, is he's down pretty far, both in his favorability and in key states he needs to win, like Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan, which is a state he should win, is in play. It's just not looking good for him as he starts. But, you know, he's got a year to go and he's got a lot of money. Julia, when you talk to the Biden campaign, What's their justification for not running on the issues, not running on the economy, not even running on abortion? Well, looking at this issue, in a way, if you go back to 2019 and 2020, even though that was pre-January 6th, Biden was still running as the democracy candidate in a way, running to restore the soul of America, if you will. And I think right now, when you look at Biden's low favorabilities, um, you know, his negative numbers, it's not only among independents, but it's among his base. And he needs his base to turn out. He needs that Democratic coalition. There was a USA Today poll out yesterday showing him declining with black voters and young voters. And this is an issue in their calculus that will animate that base. Look, and you saw the, the images in this ad, not only of January 6th, but of Charlottesville. That speaks to black voters um, as well. My pal Eric Erickson made an interesting point, Scott. I thought uh, that every time that President Biden attacks Donald Trump on the issues of January 6th, uh, his poll numbers go up. Every time he's indicted by the Biden Justice Department, his poll numbers go up. In a way, this comes close to being, I don't want to say a Biden endorsement, but certainly this, these kinds of speeches are a big Biden help to Donald Trump. 
They are. And we look at, you know, the some of the efforts, not by the Biden campaign, but some by some Democrats to take him off the ballot in places like Colorado. It certainly helps on fundraising. I, I, look, it, what the polling tells us is most people have an opinion on Donald Trump and most people have an opinion on his role on January 6th and all these convictions and indictments. Some of them think he's very guilty and should be in jail. Some of them think it's all a farce. Ones who think it's a farce, they're the ones who look at this and say, hey, this is just someone go- coming after a guy I like. And that's why we see the support. Yeah, but there's, even a lot of, there's a lot of Republicans I talk to who don't like Donald Trump, don't want him to be on the ticket. But this made this kind of language yeah. and the indictments make them angry. They, it rallies them to Donald Trump. And look, Julie, to be fair, we've seen Democrats try to get Trump friendly or very Trumpy candidates mm-hmm. on the ballot and work for them right. in order to not run against moderate Republicans, meddle in, in the primaries. Does the Biden campaign even care about the optics that that we're just now talking about of of helping Donald Trump? Um, You know, not necessarily look, because I think they're trying to focus on their own base. They have a real base problem right now. I mean, of course, they want to focus on independent and moderate voters, but they need to be focused on really animating their base. Right now, the base is not excited about Joe Biden. They're not. I don't think anyone's really excited about a Joe Biden, Donald Trump matchup, but it's a base problem for Biden. And this is an issue that he's going to lean on. See, and you're nodding along, too. That means we have agreement. We can move on. It's good to see you. (laughs) Thank you very much, my friends. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll see you guys on the trail. Our continuing coverage of the Epstein papers, the release happened. Chris Cuomo next with what we're hearing from the lawyer of the only person in jail because of some really awful behavior by Jeffrey Epstein and that woman. Back to our breaking news as we have now gotten another 300 plus pages from the Jeffrey Epstein files. They include witnesses describing Ghislaine Maxwell directing a room full of underage girls to kiss, dance, and touch each other in a sexual way for Epstein's pleasure. Chris is here. You've got Maxwell's attorney on tonight. I noted to Gloria all read earlier, there's an irony here, right? That there were so many women who were victimized Uh, for the pleasure of at least one man and possibly many more, at least allegedly many more. And yet the only person spending prison time is a woman. Right. That's because I don't know about them anymore. They didn't bring the cases. Uh, And I think that this story has more to do with your last segment than it has anything to do with the dignity of the multiple victims, many of whom, if not all, were underaged at the time that they make their accusation at what happened. I don't think it's about them. And I'll tell you why it's, I don't think it's about them. I think it's about the campaign. I don't think the timing is a coincidence. I don't think the areas of who are interested in this and what they're calling a client list. We have no basis for calling this a client list. And here's how we know. This is not at all speculation. Investigators comb through everything that's being released right now. They didn't bring cases. So what's the explanation? Ah, this is the politics. Deep state, Leland, deep state. They didn't want to make cases against these big lefties, so they didn't. Now, I think that that's politics. But what we're doing is we're combing through all of this because I do care about the women who made the accusations. And I do care about all of them said it was a ring. It was so coordinated. Now, to me, it's not about a man or a woman being in jail. Maxwell, in this case, female. But where are all the other people? That's why we're looking into it. All right. Well, uh, it, wow. Wouldn't it be fascinating if Maxwell talked? Uh, her attorney's on with you next. Uh, keep looking through the documents. I know your team's got a lot of work to do. We'll see you at the top of the hour. Coming up next, the DeSantis campaign puts everything into Iowa in a latchest effort to save a campaign. Chip Roy's not going to like me to say this. Commands on life support. Can anything revive this patient? The largest... Migrant caravan of the past year is making its way to the U.S. southern border. 15,000 people from 24 countries. They're calling themselves a poverty exodus. Wednesday, 60 House Republicans traveled to Eagle Pass, Texas, to see the surge at the border firsthand. Notably missing, Chip Roy of Texas. He said to our partners at the Hill, our people, law enforcement, ranchers, local leaders, are tired of meeting speeches and press conferences. It is time to act with urgency. Congressman Chip Roy, Republican of Texas, is with us now. You're joining us from Iowa. I know you're a surrogate for Ron DeSantis. We'll get to the campaign in a minute, sir. But I want to understand this because immigration does tie so closely into the Republican campaign. You say it's time to act with urgency. Um, Sure. H.R. 2, 
Uh, it's you've got a House bill. It has absolutely no chance in the Senate. President Biden's not going to sign it. Is it time to be honest with people and say, look, unless President Biden changes his stance and his immigration policies, there's not much to do. Yeah, well, this is where I believe we have an opportunity as Republicans to lead. And the reason I didn't go down to the border, as you noted, was that I wasn't going down for another statement, another show uh, hearing. You know, I talk to people on the border all the time. You know what they told me day before yesterday? They said, shut down the border or shut down government. And people always say, well, you guys, you know, you bluster on this stuff. The fact is our power, our singular power in Congress is to use the power of the purse to constrain an executive branch that's out of control. Alejandro Mayorkas is suing us in court to stop Governor Abbott from cutting the Constantino wire. Right. They're going to sue us to stop us from having laws to enforce people coming into Texas illegally. I had six kids die in the school district in which my family lives from fentanyl poisoning. We had 53 migrants who died in a tractor trailer, illegal aliens in a tractor trailer. I understand the problem. So you're, I I understand the problem. We reported on it extensively. But to get to get back to where where you're leading, where you want to go, is you're saying the way Republicans lead is by shutting down the government and saying we're not funding the government until President Biden changes his border policies. Let me ask you a question. Why would I agree to fund the government at Nancy Pelosi's spending levels to fund Alejandro Mayorkas to stick his finger in the eye of the people that I represent and endanger them? Someone explain, reverse it. This isn't about, oh, you're going to shut the government down. My point is, why would I give him money to endanger my people? That's exactly what we're doing. So Republicans ought to stand up, tell the president, Mr. President, Mm -hmm. we're not going to fund this government to continue to do that. We will fund troop pay. We will fund Border Patrol pay. But we're going to hold the line and say you're going to change your policies. You don't get to make up the law. You don't get to flout the law. You don't get to ignore the law and endanger the American people in the process. Yeah, That's no, what I, they're I, doing. I, I, so do, you you, make, you make a great point. Way, we hold do, all do, the cards. You, I, I, you, make a great, you make a great point. When you, turn, when you turn the funding question around, why do you fund something that doesn't work, um, yeah. it does change the dynamic. Re- Republicans have, a ten, have, have historically lost... Uh, government shutdowns. But it gets me to the, the border question in Ron DeSantis, who's tried to run on the immigration platform. He's yep. uh, hit Donald Trump for not finishing the wall on and on. I'm wondering why I'm not hearing that from him, why I'm not seeing him down on the border saying just that, shut the government down. Why isn't he holding a, a lot of Trump supporters feet to the fire on this issue? Yeah, well, Governor DeSantis went to the border with me last summer. Um, He knows exactly Mm -hmm. what he would do, take on the cartels. He would end this on day one with a merging declaration. He's been very clear about that. But he was also very clear, this matters, when he was in the Freedom Caucus in 2018, he was siding with conservatives to say we need to pass legislation that would change the laws to prohibit the abuse of the laws that we're seeing now under Biden. Guess what? President Trump didn't. He sided with Paul Ryan, and he chose amnesty over security. We know right. Ron DeSantis will get the job done. That's why I'm here. He's somebody who delivers results. Okay, Congressman, I'm going to cut you off before the computer does. Thank you. We'll see you on the trail in Iowa. Yeah. Cuomo has Ghislaine Maxwell's lawyer next. <laughs> 